Thank you for joining us. I will now turn it over to Chancellor Diermeyer to begin the event. Hello, thank you for joining us today as we look ahead to a promising spring semester at Vanderbilt. My name is Daniel Diermeyer and I'm the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. I wanna welcome you to this event and we all here at Vanderbilt are looking forward to our students return later this month. Uh, faculty and staff members have been preparing tirelessly over the last few weeks to get us where we need to be. And we also have some new information and suggestions with you to share throughout this event. Some of you may have actually been at a similar um, web seminar uh, about half a year ago, a little less than half a year ago, when during last summer, we made the decision to invite our students back to campus. Um, and uh, now we are six months later, five months later, and we are extremely pleased on where we are. Uh, this was a challenging semester. Um, it was a challenging semester for students, for faculty, uh, for staff, and of course, uh, for you parents on the, uh, on the call as well. Um, but we are in about as good a shape as we can hope for. And this is, is, is due to um, the tremendous dedication of our faculty and staff, but also importantly, uh, to our students' resilience um, that participated fully and that embraced what was necessary in order to have a successful uh, fall semester. And of course, parents and family also played a crucial role here uh, to support their students in what, what has been and will be a difficult and challenging time. And also, I think, to enforce, um, to make sure uh, that we all understand, you know, what the specific guidelines and rules are, how we're thinking about this, and what's necessary for all of us in order to make sure uh, that our students at Vanderbilt can continue to thrive. Today's discussion will have three main components. Uh, first, uh, our provost, Susan Arventi, and several experts will discuss the spring semester from a medical and operational point of view. Uh, during this discussion, uh, we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Donald Brady, who is the Senior Associate Dean for Health Science Education and Executive Vice President for Educational Affairs for Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. We will also hear from Linda Norman, who is the Dean of the Vanderbilt School of Nursing and Valerie Potter Manafee, Professor of Nursing. Our School of Nursing has played a very important part um, in particular on the contract tracing and testing side and will continue to do so. Um, and and uh, nobody you know, on this, from the School of Nursing played a bigger role on that. And Pam Jones will also join us, who is the Senior Associate Dean for Clinical and Community Partnerships in the School of Nursing. And she's the co-commander of the university's Public Health Central Command Center, which has been coordinating the very different operational aspects of our response to COVID. After that, we will hear from Pooja Jagashia. She is a senior in the College of Arts and Science and serve, serves as committee chair for Vanderbilt Student Government's Academic Affairs Committee. Uh, she will speak with several faculty and academic staff about how the residential and academic experience will look in the coming months. Uh, so you get a sense for what student life and the educational aspects are like. And uh, we are excited to welcome as part of this discussion, the Shaul Kellner, who is Associate Professor of Sociology and Jewish Studies, Julian Vernon, who is the Assistant, uh, Assistant Dean for Academic Programs and Research Assistant Professor of Chemical and Molecular Engineering in the School of Engineering, uh, Melissa Grisalfi, who is the Dean of the Martha Ingrams, Martha Rivers Ingram Commons, and a Professor of Mathematics Education, and Roman Kurtulis, who is Faculty Head of Moore College and Associate Professor of Operations Management uh, in the own Graduate School of Management. And then finally, for our last part, we will have a question and answer session to, uh, to address uh, many of the questions that were submitted. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to the discussion. And again, I want to um, welcome you to this event and now please to hand it over to our provost, Susan Arventi. Well, thank you so much, Chancellor Diermeyer. To all the students who are logging in to this town hall, I'm truly looking forward to welcoming so many of you back as you arrive on campus for this spring semester. Our success this spring semester is really going to continue to depend upon your actions and the decisions that you make, just like it did in the fall semester. For the spring, this is gonna include what you're doing before you come back to campus. It's gonna include what you do during your travels 
to arrive to campus. And then of course, once you're back here with us. I really wanna emphasize how we all together must continue to take personal responsibility in following the university's safety protocols. And we're gonna discuss these um, much, much more during this town hall. First, I, I also want to join Chancellor Deermeyer in thanking Dean Linda Norman and Senior Associate Dean Pam Jones for their expertise and their truly heroic efforts in keeping our community as safe and healthy as possible. Along with many faculty and staff members in the university, as well as in the medical center, they have led the way with our program, both in testing, contact tracing, and protocols. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Donald Grady for joining us today. His medical expertise is gonna provide us with valuable insights during this conversation. So we all have the really unique opportunity and we all have the means to come together as safely as possible in a way that upholds our mission, our mission of residential learning and excellence in your educational experience. We know how to do this. We know how to take care of ourselves and each other. And by being stronger together, we're gonna to keep the lines of communication open. We're gonna keep the lines of learning discovery open despite the truly significant challenges that exist in, under this pandemic. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today and let's get started with the town hall and some questions. So um, I'm gonna start off with um, Donald Brady, Dr. Donald Brady. Um, good morning, how are you? So I, I want you to kind of start out with Dr. Brady with um, talking about why is Vanderbilt the place that students want to be and the place where families want their children to be, um, even though we're in such a pandemic condition? Uh, Provost Wendy, that is a really great question. And I think the, the answer to that centers really on two things. One is community and second is safety. So you want to be here because we understand the importance of being together and that the trials and tribulations and successes and failures that a student experiences in an undergraduate classroom or in law school or med school is bolstered by being able to turn to a classmate who's going through the same experience and being able to share that with them. And so we understood from the beginning and you understood and Chancellor DMR and everyone, the importance of being together. But combined with the importance of being together was the importance of safety. And so you have an administration, a faculty, a staff, and a student body, I will emphasize, that is, is learning to gather the importance of safety, the importance of masking, the importance of distancing. And by being able to pull the community and the safety together with the learning, I think we've created the ideal place to be this spring. Well, well thank you for that reflection. Um, I also know, as we any of us pick up our newspapers every day, that the vaccine is top of mind. And it's top of mind, not just for members of the Vanderbilt community, but, but for really um, everyone. Can you give us a quick update on the vaccine and where you know, Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville currently stand on its rollout? Yes, ma'am. The, the vaccine is a really exciting and important next step in our effort to deal with the pandemic and where we go with this. It's not the end all and be all. We still need to mask. We still need to distance, but it's really exciting. Uh, Tennessee as a state is in the top 10, both in the number of vaccines that have already been delivered, as well as in the proportion of the vaccines that are coming to our state that are actually getting in an arm. They're actually being, so that's really an exciting piece. The medical center uh, is being very efficient, has put a, together a great plan, is working to vaccinate its staff, uh, its frontline workers, uh, environmental services, everyone who's at the medical center, including our patient-facing students is from the School of Nursing and the School of Medicine who are involved in clinical care. Are, we're beginning to roll out vaccines to patients next week. And again, we will be working with the State Department of Health to continue that rollout uh, it's very exciting uh, next step, but it's part of the plan. It's not the end all be all yet. So kind of digging a little bit deeper into that, um, what specifically do you think, and we know this can change, but what do you think are the implications of the vaccine rollout for um, students this spring? 
I, I heard you mentioned that our School of Nursing and School of Medicine students who are patient facing and engaged in clinical activities are being vaccinated, but what about the broader student body? Yeah, uh, Provost Wendy, that's, that's a really good question. I think the implications are for the spring, especially for these next few months, is an, a, a light at the end of the tunnel, an excitement about what will come. It will not be necessarily a direct delivery to our students in the next one to two months. It all depends on multiple factors, including production of the vaccine, distribution to the states, distribution out to healthcare centers that can deliver the vaccine, and then actually getting it into arms and doing that efficiently. So I think uh, we've dealt with this pandemic for 10 months. Uh, so we need patients to get the full rollout across all of our population, including our students. Uh, I think those who have health conditions will probably get it earlier than the young 20 something who may not have a health condition. But the intent and the direction and the ultimate goal is to have everyone vaccinated. So we have the herd immunity we need across the nation in order to protect all of us and to hopefully defeat this pandemic in the end. So I think the implications are uh, be patient, be watching. We're doing all the medical center, the university, all of us are doing all we can to watch this and help this progress along and get our students vaccinated. But the implications are uh, you are part of the system and we will get to you. And uh, it is all for the good, not of the just of the individual, but of the public. It's a uh, vaccinating segments protects other segments as well. So it sounds like I hear that message, be patient, be vigilant, you know, pay attention. Um, but the vaccine rollout um, right now, we know under its current structure is gonna take some time. So what would you um, tell our students you know, about their actions this semester while we're waiting um, for that continued rollout? Provost Wendy, that's a really, really good question. And it's the same message that I would give to our students, our faculty, our staff, our clinicians who are vaccinated, whether you're vaccinated or not, we are learning about this vaccine. We believe it's safe. The studies have shown it to be effective, but there's still more to learn. So we cannot, we cannot uh, get away from the masking, the distancing, the gathering sizes, all the things that we put in place for the fall and continue to, to follow now, we, we've got to stick with those. Those are public health measures in addition to the vaccine. It's all important. No one piece of that is the ultimate answer. It's all of it together. It's working together. It's reminding me if I walk out of my office without my mask on, I want a student or staff member to look at me and say, Dr. Brady, could you put your mask on? And I will say, yes, thank you for reminding me. We're in this together. And so it's doing everything else above and beyond just the vaccine that will get us through uh, the next few months. Very good. So um, what that tells me is that the campus, even as the vaccine rolls out, is gonna continue to look much the same, that we'll still see all those medical center employees wearing masks. We'll see our medical and nursing students have been vaccinated wearing masks because they are really working to help protect the rest of the community in terms of doing that. Very yes, ma'am. And we will learn as we go forward. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Brady. I may come back to you, so don't go away too far. I'll be I'm, here. I'm going to turn now to Dean Norman. Um, so thank you so much, um, Dean Norman, for joining us. And um, I'd like you to really um, speak some more um, about our campus protocols and in particular, whether or not we've had any changes or updates to those um, for the spring. So our, our spring protocols are just as same as what they were for the fall, that you know, you're gonna hear about masking, social distancing, hand hygiene, that all of those continue to be really important. The other part is that we're having to uh, abide by what the Metro Nashville gathering size is. And our gathering size at this point is only eight people at a time. So while in the fall, we had a lot of outdoor activities because it was warm. Now we know that people are gonna be more inside. Um, there, there's still smaller dining tents that people will have outside where they can be together for, um, for their meals. <clears throat> but we need to be very careful 
about what we do inside, that we need to continue to make sure that we're doing social distancing. Students can, can be together in groups, but small groups. What we found was that there was no transmission of disease during uh, our classes or our labs, which meant all of our protocols really worked well. Where were their problems? It was when people got too familiar with each other, too relaxed and didn't follow social distancing or didn't follow mask wearing. And usually that was in a casual setting. So we need to really make sure that we follow those protocols uh, at the time, particularly during our cold weather time. Um, I think we all are hoping, uh, you can see in my background, I'm, I'm wishing for spring quickly. Um, so may we have an early Nashville spring to where we can all get outside, but even getting outside, we need to make sure that we're wearing masks, that we're keeping our, our distance with each other, and that we're really paying attention to hand hygiene. And this is particularly important if students go off campus, that we encourage people to stay and we're doing activities. I know you'll hear about more um, during this call, but activities to, to keep ourselves engaged. But off campus is where the biggest threat to people um, developing COVID, because when we look at what's going on in Nashville, of the, the amount of COVID that is within Nashville, but also when people go into areas that they're taking their mask off to eat, they're maybe not social distancing, but they're in indoor activities that are enclosed. And that's where we're at greatest risk. So for us, our protocols are the same. Mask up, back up, wash up. Well, um, thank you, Dean Norman. And I, just as you were reiterating in terms of how you know, university leadership is very committed to helping students um, with these protocols also. And I think especially um, we're committed to supporting students who you know, want to plan and implement you know, extracurricular and activities and programs that can be held under conditions that are as safe as possible. And, and myself as provost, um, I wanna especially encourage our students to take this initiative and to work with us, to work with the faculty, to work with the staff on doing this. It's a partnership. Um, and and I, I think it's a great opportunity for our students to continue to show their leadership, um, especially under these conditions. I, I think we can be social while physically distancing and wearing masks. And as, as Dr. Brady pointed out, we've had 10 months of practice to really figure some of that out. But you know, Dean Moore, Norman, from your perspective, um, do you have any recommendations on how our students can you know, plan activities while also abiding by the protocols? I think being able to look at group size <clears throat> is gonna be really important um, for people and to look at where you're gonna have your activity. Are you gonna, you need to be able, if you're gonna get together in a social group of eight or less, you need to be in an area that um, will support you having your six feet distance. And that is the really important part. Pam Jones has a fabulous example of students having a pizza party together where they were all in a circle, six feet apart, the pizza was in the middle, and they went individually to get their pizza, have their pizza, put their mask back on. You know, that <clears throat> that's a way people can get together. I think we've learned all kinds of tricks in being able to have social interaction, but remembering that we can't relax on this. Just because we can have eight people together, doesn't mean that we have to, to uh, decrease the distance that we have. So keeping our activities and, you know, I think our students are the most creative that we have. They can figure out what kind of really cool activities they can do together, but keeping these protocols in place. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna pivot right now because I um, want to bring in Dean Pam Jones. Um, and uh, welcome, 
Dean Jones. Thank you. And um, I want to have us have a little bit of a conversation here about our testing procedures for the spring, uh, because these will be different from the fall. So what can students expect for testing this semester? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this because we're actually really excited about some enhancements that we've been able to to implement for just an additional layer of safety uh, for our program for the spring. Um, undergraduates will be still be doing a saliva test similar to what they did in the uh, fall. It is a slightly different collection mechanism, but but they know they are the best spitters in the country and they know exactly how to go do all that. So we will be doing that uh, again, um, but we're gonna be doing it twice a week. And you might be asking yourself why twice a week? Well, it just gives us an additional checkpoint throughout the week to identify individuals who are positive then rapidly contact trace and get them into isolation and close contacts into quarantine. So we're excited about that. The other thing is, that we've identified a vendor who has a much rap more rapid turnaround time. And why is that significant? It's significant because if it takes you 48 hours to get the test back, then you've had somebody out in the general, or let's say three days. With our prior vendor, we had a longer turnaround time. The shorter the turnaround time, the more quickly you can get people out of the general population that need to be. And that's really the essential part of of stopping the spread of COVID is to get people isolated and quarantined as quickly as possible. And we're just really excited to have this additional layer of safety and security as we go into the spring. Thank you. Yes, I, I'm excited about it too. And I'm also thankful for these kind of new innovations in testing platforms and increased availability of them that we've been able to secure. Absolutely. Um, I also know that, that many families have questions about pre-arrival testing uh, before their student comes back to campus and um, why the university is not you know, offering that this semester as we did in the spring. And perhaps you can provide some context in terms of that decision. Absolutely, and that's a, that's a really great question because it seems a little counterintuitive to not be doing arrival pre-arrival testing, but there's really a very good reason for it. Um, we know that from our experience in the fall that some of the most at-risk time period was the period between when students took their pre-arrival test, said goodbye to all their friends and family, traveled to campus, and then arrived at campus. So actually, in some ways, not doing that pre-arrival testing and doing a rapid arrival testing is a much more reliable mechanism to identify who is positive when they hit campus. So what we're gonna do, because we have a rapid cycle test, now we did not have that in the fall, so this, this plan was not feasible in the fall. We're gonna test them when they get to campus, ask them to shelter in place until that test result is back, which will be a very short period of time. During that sheltering in place, they can get food, they can do the medical, you know, those normal kind of things that you have to do, but just avoiding contact with others and avoiding campus activities during that short period of time. And then we're gonna test them again three to four days later. Because if you think about the incubation period of the virus and how long it takes, if you happen to come in contact with the virus during your travel time, that's the perfect time to start to identify individuals who've become positive during that vulnerable period. So we actually feel like this is a much more enhanced, scientifically advanced approach to identifying students who are positive when they return to campus. Very good. And I, I know we're also encouraging our students to um, really take care in their activities before they travel or before they do that arrival test. Um, yes. And they may want to, it, it, we're, we also are encouraging people to get tested if you can in your own community before you leave, because then you can isolate at home versus in the support and surrounding support of your family versus isolating when you come to campus. So we would strongly recommend if you have access to testing to go ahead and do that just for a personal sort of check and make sure that you, you might want to rather isolate at home. Great. That's great. Well, we've learned a lot about testing. I know you've learned um, 
you know, so much about how to guide our students based upon all the results from contact tracing that your tremendous team has done. Um, in particular about what the risks are and about how COVID-19 spreads. So from a medical perspective, can you really talk to us about the major lessons that we've learned from looking at that, that data and evidence in the fall semester? Absolutely, and, and I think Dean Norman touched on it well. Um, what we've seen is, again, small groups of people getting together, people get comfortable with their friends group, and they assume that because they've been tested at some frequency, that that means that they are not positive. But the problem with testing is it's only as good as the day you take the test in, in all seriousness because of the way this virus behaves with an incub a long incubation period and all kinds of factors. So we strongly encourage people to just assume the people around you are positive and use those precautions. We've, we've had wonderful, wonderful students and they have done such a great job in general of trying to follow the rules and, and be careful, but people just get too comfortable and particularly those individuals who are highly social and have lots of different social groups. If you go out to lunch with five different groups of people throughout the week, you are really, uh, one of our infectious disease doctors at the medical center describes it as think of somebody that they have a radioactive backpack on. And the more you come in contact with them or the more you come in contact with people with that same radioactive backpack, the more likely you are to to be exposed. So uh, it's just common sense. Just, you know, tr try to stay away from people as much as you can and, and use good judgment when, when it comes to how much you expose yourself to, to others. So it's really an emphasis on um, masking and physically distance um, while you're being social. Absolutely. <laughs> be social, but be careful. <laughs> but follow those, you know, um, mask up and step back. Very yep. good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, we've gotten a lot of insights through the discussions with those three leaders. And now I think it's a great time to turn over the discussion um, to a group of faculty. And this is gonna be led by um, one of our very own Vanderbilt students, Pooja. It's great to see you here. You and too, Prima I'm Swinti. looking forward to, to hearing this discussion. Thank you, Prima Swinti. And to our students and families, it's great to connect in the lead up to an exciting semester. As a senior, I know that this academic year has been a challenge. I've seen so many of our tremendous students um, show resilience when faced with the changes that have happened since the pandemic began. We have endured massive shifts on campus and in our personal lives, and we have done so with innovation and fortitude. The fall semester was neither easy nor familiar, but it laid a tremendous foundation for everything we can continue to achieve together. We are joined by several faculty members who are excited to share their perspectives about this spring. First, Professor Kellner. You were really engaged during the fall semester, especially in your work as a VU Scepter and in your classes. Can you speak to the value of offering in-person classes in addition to alternative virtual platforms as well as engaging with your students outside of the classroom? Thank you, Pooja, yes. Um, well, look, a lot of faculty and students can't be in the classroom even though they want to. I was one of the people who was actually fortunate to be in person on campus, so I'll speak to that. Uh, I polled my students on the first day of class about how they felt about being in the classroom. And the two words that came up the most were excited and grateful. And the professors who were on campus there that I was speaking with all felt the same way. And I think that part of the reason was that every day brought small wins. So I was one of the many professors who was able to meet one-on-one -on -one with my students, with my view septees, and we would walk through Bishop's Commons, we'd circle the alumni lawn loop, just talking like professors and students are supposed to do. And doing something as simple as that, it felt like we were scoring a victory over, over COVID. Um, but there were also, there were things in August that we didn't think would be possible, but by September and October, we figured out how to make them work. So I'll give two examples from my own experience. And I know that any of my colleagues could also give a lot of other examples of their own. I was teaching a class on Cold War human rights, and I wanted to replicate an old summer camp simulation from the 1970s. But it's COVID. I figured this is going to end up on the scrap heap. But we took it to the dining tents. We spread way out. 
And at the different stations, instead of getting papers signed or stamped, because passing the papers could also pass the virus, we, you would take a selfie with the station worker behind you, giving the thumbs up. And by the way, the station workers, some of them were quarantine students who were Zooming in remotely. So they were fully engaged in this in-person, up mobile, out of the seat uh, um, learning experience. And then at the end of the semester, like we really felt like we had earned our right to celebrate, but I couldn't invite the students to my home for dinner. So I took the class on a historical walking tour of campus instead, masked, distance, but social. And it ended up being a really special way of celebrating being together as a community at Vanderbilt. So basically my, my point is you can take the attitude, oh, it's COVID time and we can't do this and we can't do that and it's just not gonna work. Or you can start by saying, yes, we can, and then get creative and figure out how to make it work. And I think what the faculty proved this past fall is that we can do this. And for the spring, we're bringing all of this expertise with us. Um, I'll, I'll just, I, I'll end by saying this. I see this not just as a college professor, but also as a college parent. I have two kids uh, in school out of state. Um, back in March, when COVID first started shutting things down, my daughter's a cappella choir was staying with us. And I saw 14 kids burst into tears in my living room. So we know that COVID's toll is not just me measured in terms of physical health, but also mental health. And anything that brings us back together safely in community and restores even a semblance of normalcy goes a long way to helping us all stay resilient. And in-person classes are a really important part of that. And part of what I'm grateful for is that the team that's been in charge of Return to, to Campus has set up a structure that's safe and that's made it possible for me to try to give to my students the type of college experience that I wish my own kids were able to have. And I know from talking to my faculty colleagues that, that I'm not alone in that. Thank you so much for all of those insights on community, Professor Kellner. I'm sure all of your students feel really lucky to have you um, on their team during this time. Um, up next, we have Assistant Dean Vernon. So Assistant Dean Vernon, you continue to work regularly with faculty within the School of Engineering. What have you seen of faculty this academic year and more specifically their plans for the spring semester and how they plan to support students during this pandemic? Thank you, Pooja. I think that's a great question. So faculty in general has made extraordinary efforts to engage and include all students in person, remote, and even our international remote students. So one example from our first year program, we give students hands-on design experience. So therefore, as you can imagine, that hands-on proportion had to be reconfigured this past fall. So in the civil engineering module, students were, student groups were deconstructed so that only one student at a time was allowed to go into the design room to work on a specific aspect of the wind turbine project. Remote students were heavily engaged in the planning and calculation of the design details. Another example comes from the module that I teach. I also included STEAM team projects, but what was different this year was that I focused on communicating um, knowledge gained through presentations, whether it was from researching new technology to designing a scale up of process plans. Another course example is from our senior design course. The students received an increase in one-on-one -on -one TA and faculty time during the term. It was a great check-in and instructors really saw how teams were and who was struggling. It helped keep all the groups moving forward and more quickly helped them move past the sticking points. There were remote presentations and remote judging. Lots of learning happened and we all got better at it. Um, which sets us up really well for doing it again this term. Not to say one team had something go very wrong with a Zoom link, um, we wasn't sure what happened, but they set up a new link, sent it to faculty and TAs, and we can relay it to the judges. So really it was some rapid decision and great fast thinking by the different teams. So these examples showcase how the engineering faculty are reconfiguring delivery of instruction and increasing one-on-one -on -one contact with students in the form of more office hours and structured team check-ins. One thing I would like to highlight to you as families and students listening in on this, on this town hall is communication is key. Students should communicate with course instructors, faculty advisors, academic counselors, if an issue comes up. And it can be as small as an absence from class to my laptop fell down the stairs and broke. 
or I don't understand the content this week. Um, having students communicate this with their instructors and with others, um, that's the way we can help them kind of come up with a plan to address those issues. Thank you so much for those examples and for taking the time to successfully engage with all of your students, Assistant Dean Vernon. Up next, we've got Dean Grisolfi. So Dean Grisolfi, what efforts are being made to sustain Vanderbilt's unique residential experience, even in light of the changes this academic year and how are students handling these changes? Thanks for asking that question, Pooja. I wanna echo what a lot of our colleagues, my colleagues have shared is that this fall, we explored a lot of different options um, and tried every single way we could think of, I think, to get together as safely as possible. And the good news is that we learned a lot. Some of what we learned was what didn't work, but that's actually just as valuable as learning what does work. Um, and what we have learned is that there's lots of ways to get together safely. In the fall, we um, got together to watch the presidential debates. We, got, we gathered together around fire pits in my backyard. We um, watched movies together. We even ate meals together. So being together safely truly is possible. And the good news for the spring is that we explored all those different um, kinds of events and we really have some ideas about what we can do from the get-go moving forward. Um, here's one starting point. Um, I think most people know that first, most first-year students are switching residences between semesters. And actually, um, I'm kind of like, uh, excited and really optimistic about what this will do as an opportunity for students to connect. Because although students will still be the same, uh, part of their same house community, they'll actually get to be part of a new and different hall community. And that's a great way to expand your social network. And here's why. Your hall community is always your first community. It's always the group of people who you meet first. It's easiest to go to a meal with these folks. They see you in your pajamas. They're, it's a kind of realism that in fact, you don't really have in any other part of your life. But the reality is for everyone, for some people, that hall community is a great community. You hit it off with those folks. You can't wait to see them when you come back for the break. For other folks, that first hall community was not your best community. This has nothing to do with COVID. This is what happens every year. But what's different about this year is that you have a chance to make a second hall community. If you loved your first hall community, the good news is when you move, you are still a five minute walk at most away from those folks. If you want a chance to meet a new first community, this is your opportunity. You'll have a new hall, a new group of people to meet from the first day, and a new opportunity to form a first great group of friends. But of course, we know that programming in the houses is not the only thing that sustains our community. We also do a lot on the commons and through residential colleges to try to create opportunities for students to gather safely together. Um, so uh, in the early weeks of the semester, as you know, um, all of our programming will be online to make sure that everyone has had their testing come through and everyone is safe. Um, and houses will be offering their signature events online. I wanna say that um, it's no one's favorite version of programming to be online all the time. Uh, people who are hosting those programs don't love them, just as students who are attending those programs don't love them. But the reality is that it is better to gather together online than not to gather at all. And so as the university has released guidelines about online programming, we're following those guidelines. As the guidelines change and open up, we will follow those guidelines and begin to gather in person. Um, some of the first events we have developed on the commons is about helping to create, um, to, to meet students where they're at to address questions that they have. So one of our first events is with Dr. Buddy Creech, who's the director of the Vanderbilt Vaccine Research Program. And we've invited him to talk about his research and to answer questions and address misconceptions about the development of the COVID vaccine. We're gonna host that as a webinar because it will be hosted on February 2nd. And also we want it to be a webinar because we want to make sure as many students as possible can gather. Um, and I know that this will be an, of interest to a lot of us. The second set of programs we're hosting right away when you get back um, it, are hosted by Associate Provost Jill Stratton and they're called Building in Breaks. And the goal of these workshops is to help students think about how do you manage your time in anticipation of the reading days that we have coming February 23rd and 24th. What we wanna make sure does not happen is that students 
um, sort of use those reading days to catch up on work instead of using the reading days to truly take a break. And the way to make sure that happens is to plan your time in advance. And so we really want to think about how to support students to do that. Once we're able to meet in person, our programs are going to resume in small groups according to the guidelines. We have so much planned already. Um, we already have a series of Dean's dinners planned. We have a movie series planned. We have a fitness series planned um, and a really exciting lecture with Latasha Brown that's on February 16th. Mostly what I want to emphasize, though, is that although the fall was really different from anything any of us have experienced or imagined, and although, of course, it was really difficult, students were unbelievably creative in figuring out how to make their first year of college as successful as possible, from creating their own cornhole and spike ball tournaments and running groups to taking advantage of all of the programming that we've offered, we saw students making the best of the situation. And really, that's the only way we can go forward. We really cannot change the fact that we're living in a pandemic. And we can't make our on-campus life look like it does when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. All we can do is figure out how to be together safely, how to connect with and support each other, even though how we do it is different. Students really did an amazing job in the fall. And we are all ready to keep going with that work in the spring. Thank you for sharing, Dean Yersalfi. I'm really excited to see students um, build on the creative momentum they laid down in the fall. Finally, Professor Kurtulas, as the faculty head for Moore College, you worked extremely hard to ensure your students were still able to connect with one another despite the changes this year. Can you talk about some of your efforts and also the students who took initiative themselves to connect and how you hope the, to continue these efforts in the spring? Thank you for the question, Pooja. I'm the faculty head of Moore College, which is one of the upper division uh, residential colleges. And one of the main goals uh, as a faculty head in the uh, last fall was to ease some of the pain of social isolation and distancing and design programs that would allow our residents to connect with each other in a safe uh, environment. So in the fall, we had a mixture of virtual and in-person events. Early on, we started with virtual events uh, just to be on the cautious side. But as the university relaxed some of the, uh, some of the uh, gathering guidelines, we started to have in-person events too. Just to give you a couple of examples, our signature event here in Moore College was held virtually every week. And it was a storytelling event where every week I would invite a number of residents uh, to share their personal stories as it relates to a theme. For example, in one of our events, uh, I invited a number of international students to share their personal stories and tell us about the challenges of being international student here in the US. And every week we would pick uh, different teams. And despite being a virtual event, this event worked really great for our uh, residents because it allowed the residents to get to know each other and build a community in a safe, uh, in a safe way. Uh, we also had a number of in-person events uh, in small groups. Uh, one of the examples here is we had a series of events called Old Autumn Amusement Events. And every week students would be given a choice to pick uh, activities which are designed outdoors. One of the activities, for example, was uh, students were given a chance to go to the Dyer Observatory to view the planets. Another week they were given a chance to participate in a uh, kickball tournament and so on. In addition to those programs that were offered by residential colleges, I also noticed that our students were innovative in finding safe ways to uh, connect with their peers. Uh, for example, I observed that our students started to use the outdoor lounge very heavily. You know, they would take every opportunity to exercise or play outdoor uh, games or activities such as Frisbee on the lounge here nearby the Moore College. And I also observed that students started to dine, uh, have their meals in small groups uh, on the lawns or in the courtyard here at uh, Moore College. So going forward, as everyone else said, we learned a lot of things in the fall, and we'll certainly use some of those things in the spring. One of our challenges in the springs will be uh, the weather because it's gonna be cooler and it might not allow us to do a lot of out, uh, outdoor programming. But of course, uh, we have some heated tents around the campus, which will certainly help us uh, with some of those challenges. When you're also, we're also brainstorming to make available other safe indoor options to uh, our residents. So to summarize, we are getting ready and we look forward to seeing our residents back on campus real soon.
Thank you, Professor Kertulis, and thank you all for your insights on our academic and residential experience. It sounds like there's a lot for students to look forward to this spring. And now I will turn it back over to Provost Wenti for the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Pooja. And we now have not only um, all the individuals who participated so far in our conversation um, on our panel, but we are also going to um, invite some additional individuals who have specific expertise and backgrounds and are playing key roles in terms of our return to campus for the spring to, to join the panel. Um, our goal is over the rest of the time um, in this town hall is to be able to address pre-submitted questions and live questions um, as the time permits. So we will do as much as we can in these next minutes. So the other leaders who are, are joining us um, in addition to those panelists, include um, Dr. Andre Churchwell, who is the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and our Chief Diversity Officer. Um, also joining us, Eric Kopstein, who is our Vice Chancellor for Administration. We also have with us August Washington, who is the Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Public Safety and Special Initiatives. And Vanessa Beasley, who is Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of Residential Faculty. So uh, we've already had a, a set of discussions about students transitioning back to campus this spring, um, particularly thinking about um, students' activities and students um, finding ways to be social while wearing masks and physically distancing. I keep emphasizing that point. But I, I want to start out first with um, Vice Provost Beasley to kind of you know, reflect on what we've already discussed in this town hall and whether or not there's anything further you want to um, share to ensure students and families about how students are gonna be able to connect and reconnect when they're back on campus. Thank you, Provost Fuente, and thank you everyone for all the information we've already been able to give. I will reiterate what Dean Grisalfi said, particularly for our first year students, we know that coming back after a long break is a really significant event that first year. And I wanna assure you that all the faculty, staff and residential uh, assistants that are part of those communities are really thinking about how robust that welcome can be, even as you meet a new community and have a chance to create new friendships. That's also really true on the rest of campus as well. So we might seem like we're making a bigger deal of first year students, but we know that it's a big deal for everyone to come back right now. And I'd say that's probably true across populations that exist beyond the undergraduates. I know we're all excited after this long break to see each other. So in addition to the specific programming that will happen where students live, I've also been talking with the associate deans in our undergraduate schools and colleges about programs and ideas for ways we can help students think about how to get back into the right pace of their academic life this semester. That may mean an opportunity to think about the working with the tutoring center and the writing studio, two offices that have already extended their hours to think about how students can find support and community in those spaces. Or it also might mean thinking about how you want to do some planning and time management with our Center for Student Well-Being, because we know that getting stressed uh, about time and how things are working under these uncertain conditions is something that keeps us sometimes from reaching out for help. So I wanna assure everybody, as we think about community and welcoming everybody back, we're thinking about it at multiple levels. Some of those are programmatic and some of them are making sure that all of our members on the academic affairs side of the professional staff, that we're reaching out to students to say, we're here, you're gonna hear from your campus connector and we wanna help you make the best of the spring semester. Thank you very much, Vice Provost Beasley. So um, we're receiving or have received, we're getting quite a few questions still um, about the vaccine and about exemptions from following protocols uh, or testing. And so I'm gonna bring back on Deans Norman and Jones. Um, what would you tell students, this is the question, what would you tell students who received the vaccine about their protocol, testing and quarantine or isolation requirements for the spring semester? So we still have to follow <clears throat> our protocols of masking and distancing and hand hygiene. Um, that we, when you read all the information and Dr. Brady, you may wanna comment as well. We don't know all of, of the transmission effects uh, for as people receive the vaccine and, and it's not completely clear as to when 
they will have immunity, but it prevents them from getting the disease. What we don't know is can they still transmit anything? So staying with the protocols and the testing that we're gonna have a better idea of what is gonna, what occurs once somebody gets the vaccine um, about tra disease transmission. Yeah, and I'll just add from a contact tracing standpoint, um, you know, we will, we have to just consider them like any other student because we simply do not know enough yet. And, you know, as we get additional data and advice from our public health experts, including the CDC, we'll clearly make adjustments to those, to that approach. But for the meantime, we have to assume, you know, that, that they are like any other student vaccinated or not. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that if you have received the vaccine or when you receive the vaccine, you have to continue following all of our safety protocols. You will also continue to be tested and you will also continue to, um, if you test positive, uh, isolate and be contact traced. Um, or Absolutely. alternatively, if somebody that you have been a close contact of is positive, um, you're quarantining. Absolutely. So what about, um, in, in thinking about this, we know that the vaccine um, rollout is being guided by state at the state level. And so we cur certainly could have students who might receive a vaccine um, at home before they arrive. Um, what will be our guidance to students who might get the first dose of the vaccine at home in their home location? Can they get the second dose three weeks later um, here in Nashville or at the medical center? And if not, I'm seeing Pam starting to, Dean Jones starting to shake her head no, but if not, would they be granted permission to leave campus for the day to go home to get the second dose? Well, I'll take a shot at that and Donald or, or Linda can, can correct me. Um, you know, it's a, you have to think about this, that the organizations who are giving the first vaccine have to put a high priority on the second vaccine for somebody that they've already given the first. So the reality is that, that the, if a student gets it in their home community, they really should get their second dose in their home community. And, and we certainly would allow students to leave to go do that, or they should perhaps maybe stay at home a little longer and come to campus after they've gotten that second dose because there's just no way to assure within this community with the priority structure that has been set by the, the state of Tennessee that they will be prioritized in the same way they were in their own home state. Okay, so more, more vaccine questions coming in. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, when students might uh, be vaccinated, but the question is, do you have any idea when you will have vaccines available for our faculty? And another part of this is um, once they're available, um, are we planning to vaccinate the students, the university itself, I think is what this question is referring to, and will we make it mandatory? So I'll take a crack at the faculty piece first, <clears throat> is that the faculty uh, within Metro Nashville will be vaccinated according to the particular uh, group that they fall into, whether that's people with chronic disease, age-related groups that, you know, we've started with over 75 now, and then they'll move to over 65 and then go on down according to age. So faculty will get this as well as anybody else within Nashville will get this according to the particular priority level um, that, that they're in. Okay, thank you. Now, um, what about the question? I know I, I packed a couple things into that. What about the question in terms of, maybe I'll put it this way. Um, once the vaccine is available to students, will we make it mandatory for students to be vaccinated? So as of now, no bodies are recommending man mandatory vaccinations because it's still under an emergency use authorization. So unless something has come out very recently, there's really no recommendation to make it mandatory. Having said that, we will make every effort to educate people about the efficacy of the vaccine and the safety of the vaccine. 
and take a, an approach that does that. So we really do encourage people to become vaccinated, but it will not be mandatory. Okay. Dr. Brady, did you wanna add anything? Yeah, I think, uh, I think important points here is that vaccines are only effective when there's broad herd immunity. And so I think as, as it rolls out and there's enough for everyone to be vaccinated, we would wanna encourage people to get vaccinated because again, we believe it to be safe and effective. All the trials are showing hot, really high efficacy for the vaccine. So it will be important to uh, have people get vaccinated. Um, I think if somebody, back to the question about the first dose, I agree with everything that was said. If you got a first dose at home and you're able to get back home, it would be important to try to get back home to get the second dose, it will be easiest. However, if there's absolutely no way for you to get back home, please, reach out, whether that's to student health or someone else, because the last thing we want to do is to have a first dose given and then not the second follow-up get given because then you are basically maybe starting over. So please reach out if that extreme situation occurs. Uh, don't, don't just go uh, without reaching out. Okay, very good, absolutely. We always want to hear questions. We always wanna hear you know, what your needs are in, in these really special situations, okay? So uh, thank you. Uh, this is a, a totally different question and a different angle. Um, we've seen a lot, of, of, a lot of questions, both before this town hall, but also coming in about our reasoning for starting on January 25th and also uh, the tempo of our academic calendar, which I think is referring to the fact of a lack of a spring break. So um, Vice Provost Beasley, Vice Chancellor Kopstein, um, uh, would you like to address that question? Any, any insights in terms of the planning and the decision-making? Yeah, thank you for that question, Provost Wente. I'll start us off and then we can turn it over to Vanessa for some further comments. Um, but with the recent holiday period, we knew that people in general would be gathering to see friends and family members and traveling really at volumes that were the highest since the pandemic began. Um, and that creates opportunities for the spread of COVID. We know that symptoms can take many days to manifest and that there's really a lag effect between exposures, symptoms and positive test results and increased caseloads. So with those things in mind, we felt that it was prudent to begin the semester later than usual place some time between the start of undergraduate classes on January 25th and the holiday period. So my comment really speaks to the start date and Vanessa may want to comment on the tempo of uh, the semester. Yeah, I, I would like to speak uh, to the ending date a little bit, but also end with talking about the tempo and the pace. So just want to make the point that just as you heard Vice Chancellor Kopstein talk about the thinking about the beginning of the semester and the way uh, we were thinking about the constraints that quite frankly are upon us because of the virus um, and the period that we're in and we were, we were expecting to be in and we are. We also have some hard stops on the end and I'm not sure everybody's aware of those. We, we know we think a lot about graduation. Of course, that's very important in any university community, but we also have a major semester period and summer school schedules. And those periods are also important for the continuation, continuation, excuse me, of academic progress for our students. So sometimes people ask me, well, why couldn't you just, you know, go into the summer? And it's because some students are counting on those periods too, to think about progress towards their degree. So I just want everyone to be aware that we were also working with a constraint on the other side too. With regard to the tempo, I have to tell you, it's very much related to this question uh, because something that people may not realize is as we were discussing with faculty, particularly from all four undergraduate schools and colleges, how we would operate this spring and frankly, what the calendar would be, those faculty started asking us questions long before the students did about the pace. Faculty said, hey, we can tell this fall that our students are tired. And faculty were sharing with us that it was hard for them to keep up the pace too. So faculty independently of each other across these the four undergraduate schools and colleges started saying, how could we figure out a way to do this? Where we said, you know, let's build in just a little pause time, a little time to check in with, with each other. And frankly, they welcomed the opportunity to have conversations about well-being and pace and the way we're all taking care of each other this semester that would give them a minute outside of their regular curriculum 
they're all trying to put so much great information into that curriculum and what they teach in the semester. And they said, it'd be really nice for us too, if we could have a time with the community of students we're in three times a week, two times a week to talk about what's, what it's gonna take to get through this together. So we were really encouraged by those conversations and that led, um, led us to believe that our faculty are very committed to being creative about thinking about um, a way to create a tempo and pace that does pay attention to the unusual needs we have right now. Okay, very good. So this, this leads me to a follow up question, um, which I'm going to pitch to Dean Grisalfi and to Professor Kellner and a, a live question coming in in terms of, you know, how the new in class reading days are beneficial to students mental health when classes are still held on these days and rigorous non major assignments may still be due. What are your perspectives on on how this is going to be um, be managed and, and be a positive impact? Yeah, I know this is a question that all of us have because this is the first time we've, we've done this before. Um, and to, to think about this, I'm pulling both on my experience as Dean of the Commons, but also as a professor of teaching and learning, a person who studies how people learn and how people develop identities, because that's really how I think about um, our mission at the university and how we're thinking about how these reading days are gonna work. So on the one hand, I think we have to be very creative as a community to make sure that we help students to use these days effectively. As I indicated, we've already started to think about how do we help students to, um, to manage their time so that those reading days can be legitimate breaks. And that comes before the reading days. And that's, I think, a community responsibility that we have like here at residential colleges to do work with students to manage their time. I also note that this is actually what most adults who are not in academia actually do have to do with their time, right? Uh, my husband was so confused about why I was so exhausted this semester because even I didn't realize that I had never gotten into the habit of finding my own breaks in my time. I have always relied on the university breaks. And so this is a chance for us to help students think about their professional trajectory to think about, well, how do I build in my own breaks? But finally, now speaking as a professor in teaching and learning, the idea that classes are the space that do harm to students, that's the space that creates stress for students, I think is not the right model. Um, it certainly doesn't reflect why a professor would choose to come to a university that has rigorous teaching obligations instead of research only obligations. We don't actually think of our, uh, of course, classes are stressful, assignments are stressful, getting grades are stressful. But, but faculty like getting to know their students. As uh, Vice Provost Beasley indicated, faculty want to figure out how can we get to know our students better? Um, Professor Kellner, I think indicated, shared a lot of the things he did this past semester to do just that. So we're also really thinking with faculty collectively about if, even if we're meeting during the reading days, that doesn't mean that's a day where we just carry on with business as usual. Maybe that's an opportunity to think collectively about how the class is going, how your life is going, and to really get to connect in a different way. So I think we just have to imagine that those classes, and I know faculty are committed to this, aren't necessarily business as usual on those reading days. Professor Kellner, anything to add there? Yeah, I think one of, one of the dangers is that um, we, we have empty time that we don't actually use in a constructive way. There, you can, you, I can think about weekends that I thought were going to be relaxing, but at the end of the weekend, like where, where did it go? Because I didn't actively um, recuperate, actively rest. And so I think really a, a lot of the challenge for the reading days is gonna be both on faculty and on students to make sure that the time is used in, in a constructive way. And for that, what my, my advice to the students would be, talk to your professors and talk to them at the beginning of the semester so that this is not just something where the professors are making decisions on their own and, and the students are responding to it, but we're in this together. And so this can be a collaborative approach to think about how do we use these reading days and faculty are open to these conversations. We're, we're really, we're here for you. You're here for us. I have a student who came in when I, I gave a, a reading day um, and it was optional. People wanted to come in. Only one student showed up and I asked her, why did you come? And she said, well, I figured you might be alone. Well, you might be alone. And I felt bad for you. Like, Wow, I'm like, here, I'm trying to help you and, and, and you have my back too, it was, it was really nice. So um, 
but so really I would say work collaboratively with the faculty to make sure that these days are actually restorative, recuperative in the way that you need them to be and in the way that we need them to be. That's great. And so what I, the big message I heard right there is that this is a partnership and we really need a partnership between the students and faculty for the entire semester to be successful, but also especially for these um, blocks of in-class reading days to really have their greatest um, helpful effects. So that, that's wonderful to hear. Um, I'm now gonna to pivot to another live question and I'm going to um, invite Vice Chancellor Churchwell as well as Dean Vernon to, to help me in terms of answering this question. And so um, it reads, what are you doing to create a comfortable and welcoming place for students of color, particularly in terms of in-person, physically distanced activities? Great, I'm gonna let Dean, Dean Vernon take that one first and I'll jump in. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think that's a really, really important question. So in the School of Engineering, we're doing a lot of programming um, that targets our students of color um, and also you know, other students as well. Um, we're working with the Black Cultural Center um, to offer some programming for the spring semester. Um, a lot of times I meet with students one-on-one. -on -one. We understand that these discussions, especially with the things going on now are very hard. And sometimes some students feel in a group we may not be the best way. So I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with students and I reach out to them to see how things are going. So right now we're doing a lot of programming. Um, we're working with our e-council, um, our student orgs, students will receive a weekly newsletter on what events are happening so that they can kind of check to see what they want to attend and what they don't want to attend. But we also always add in if there's an issue that comes up, um, they are free to kind of, you know, just pop into my calendar and put a 30 minute meeting. Thank you. Well, we certainly know that the Black Cultural Center has been open and certainly events have been taking place there, Susan, socially distanced over time. Our Office uh, of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion has actually sponsored for some of the African-American postgraduate, uh, postdoctoral students, some film nights out on the lawn. That, that was when it was warmer, of course, uh, and we had films and they were socially distanced and, and we actually supplied the popcorn, I understand. Uh, so, so there are a number of things still going on, carefully structured to ensure that they follow all the rules that uh, have been outlined by Dean Norman and, and, and her team and, and also uh, uh, Dean Brady. We still have to maintain the social distance, the masking and the like, but activities are still ongoing. And if there are issues that come up, we certainly are available to deal with that. And we use uh, the Black Cultural Center and other venues for those reasons. Okay, so part of what I heard there in regard is we have a lot of resources, both centrally through our Dean's offices, as well as the Provost and the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion offices and our Inclusive Excellence office. And we also um, have a number of student organizations which are there to help support um, students of all identities and to really ensure that we're being um, as supportive as possible given the potential different um, effects on people's experiences during this really challenging semester. Okay, thank you. Let's pivot to the next question. So for this one, um, I've got Dean Jones back up here. Um, here's the question. What is the rationale for twice weekly testing? Are we expecting a higher caseload this semester? You know, we, we implemented twice weekly testing as an additional safety measure. And again, it, it became more feasible because of the shorter turnaround time test. If you think about twice a week testing, when you've got a three to four day turnaround time, it's not nearly as helpful as it will be with a shorter turnaround time. We know the caseload across the country and the caseload in, in Tennessee is higher than it was. Everyone's spiked pretty much after the holiday season. So we wanted to enter into it with this additional level of protection. We'll see what the case count is. Um, you really don't know until you start getting into it and see the, because the, our students come from all over the place. So the positive cases we will see on reentry will be related to the positivity in their own communities. And we know that. So it's, a, it's kind of like a blending pot. We've got to put everybody in there and see how it goes. 
we may decide over time, we don't need that twice a week testing, but we wanted to start in, with the most conservative approach. And our, our motto all along has been, let's be as safe as we possibly can and err on the side of caution. And that's exactly what we're doing. I also think this is consistent with what some of our peer institutions are doing with having the twice a week testing and what the Association of College Health had to say that if possible, twice a week testing might be recommended for us. Fortunately, we have the ability to do it. But I think in partnership with our other peer institution, we will learn a lot about um, the necessity of, of twice a week, but it will give us a better chance to control any type of um, positivity and be able to protect the integrity of the university a little bit better. And we recognize that it is, it's, a, it's an effort on the part of our students. You know, it, it takes time. It takes time out of their schedule. It's not convenient, but we've structured the testing center with the part of, with the help of Eric Kopstein and others to be as efficient as it possibly can. And hopefully we can get people through and quickly and they can seamlessly get their results quickly. Very good. So um, what I'm hearing is we are being nimble and flexible, um, taking into account all the evidence that's available to us. And that will continue to be true throughout um, the first weeks of the semester and the entire semester in terms of how we adapt our, our testing protocols as part Absolutely. of many different strategies we're using to contain the spread. Okay. Absolutely. Very good. So here's another question for you. Don't go away. All right. Um, can you describe the setting and attention the students receive if they do test positive while on campus? Sure. So we work very closely with uh, Randy Tarkington and GL Black uh, around the housing needs. And the first, the first layer of this is clear communication from our command center about what their status is. So they will know um, that you know, they, are, they have tested positive and that we're going to be approaching them for contact tracing. The contact tracers are nurses, either advanced practice nurses or registered nurses who reach out to them and go through a very evidence-based approach to assessing uh, their individual case and those close contacts. That conversation is, hap is, is uh, handled in the most confidential and private way we can. It's crucial that students participate with that because otherwise we do not have reliable data to determine who the close contacts are. Then once they are identified, we'll work with our housing partners to get them moved. And you know, it's not a perfect science. It takes a little time sometimes, but we are very careful in terms of communicating with them and our housing partners do an excellent job doing that. And then in addition to that, we do have a follow-up program where we do call. If they're symptomatic and sick, student health follows those students and they do that with their providers there. If they're asymptomatic, we have the contact tracing team do follow-up calls with those students. Some students opt to not have those follow-up calls. They don't feel like they need them or that it's helpful. And so we don't, we don't bother them but we try to stay in close touch and do an assessment of symptoms, how they're doing, how are they feeling um, and have additional kind of uh, discussions about their psychosocial needs as well. Okay, very good. Thank you for that, that detailed answer to that question about how we're taking care of our students. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's pivot to another live question that has come in and um, Vice Chancellor Kopstein, I'd like you to address this one. It reads, what provisions has Vanderbilt invested in to have comfortable spaces for our students during colder weather in January and February? Will heated outdoor tents or spaces be provided? And you may also want to address um, accessibility to the gyms in the rec center. Yeah, Provost Wente, I'd be happy to answer that question. It's an excellent question. So um, you may recall that during the fall semester, we utilized three large outdoor tents. And of course the weather uh, in the fall is more favorable than what we'll face in January and February, although we're all hoping for a warm spring. And as with everything else, we learned a lot from our experiences, ways to maximize the utility of the tents on campus um, 
and use them to the greatest effect programmatically and to support dining um, and appropriate degrees of human interaction. We also debriefed quite a bit um, during the break and covered a lot of lessons learned. And one of the conclusions that we reached with a consensus across the community and a lot of input from our academic partners is that it would be a better idea um, in, the, in the spring semester to have a larger number of somewhat smaller tents. So when you come back to campus, you will see that instead of three large tents, we now have five uh, still large, but somewhat less large and cavernous tents arranged across campus that will be utilized for a variety of activities, including outdoor dining. And yes, importantly, they will all be heated. We came up actually with what I think is a really excellent solution for that, where there will be hot water radiant heat coming through the floorboards of the tents, which is actually the most effective way to keep an outdoor space in the winter appropriately heated. Um, those heated venues will have the advantage of enabling us to not just have those available for dining or for coursework, but also for fitness programs. So working with our recreation center, uh, we, will, we will have um, outdoor fitness opportunities programmed that will utilize those tents. Um, in addition, uh, you may know that before the winter break, we did some experimenting with indoor dining. Uh, to figure out how to appropriately distance students and to have that work in an orderly manner. And we will expand upon that as a complement to the outdoor uh, dining locations in the tents. Um, one final remark on this question is we have also been working very closely with our colleagues in the Recreation Center to make portions of the Recreation Center indoor fitness areas available for our students um, starting in early February. There'll be more communication upcoming on that um, in the near term. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So we're gonna squeeze in another question I've got here and I'm gonna ask Dr. Brady and Dean Jones um, to address this one. The question reads, can people spread the virus even if they get the vaccine? That's a great question. I might wanna turn it to Pam first, but I'll take a stab. We, the answer, the bottom line answer is we don't know that for sure. Uh, and I think that's one reason that we're sticking with masking and distancing guidelines that as we learn uh, and as data comes around after we have a large cohort vaccinated, we'll know more about that. So for safety is again, being as conservative as possible, uh, we are keeping our guidelines in place. We don't know the complete answer to that yet. Thank you, Dean Jones. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, that's part of what has been so hard for all of us about COVID is that we are learning as we go and we do not have concrete answers to things that we would really like concrete answers to. So we will, we will learn and we will watch the data and we will watch recommendations from those bodies that make recommendations and we will go from there. Okay, so that means we all need to stay really aware and, um, and we will, of course, um, be doing that as a university so that we can let you know the latest on any changes in regard to either vaccinations or how the vaccines are um, inhibiting the spread or in particular, um, keeping our community safe. All right, here's another question up on the board. Um, so this one, um, Vice Provost Beasley, how about you, you field this one for me? So here's the question, okay? Last semester, students adapted to new ways of living and interacting on campus, and understandably, some of those changes weren't easy, though they certainly helped to keep our number of positive cases low. Given that students are looking um, at, least, at at least another full semester of these adaptations, what is the university doing to support mental health for all students? both those who are in person and those who are remote study only. Thank you. Uh, yes, we, we are very um, mindful of the impact on mental health of the pandemic and the conditions that it's created across settings, but particularly for our students, particularly for students who are not having uh, the experience that they've planned for, or frankly, that we plan for them to have. So I want to be mindful of some of the things you've already heard with regard to time management. We're trying to think about how we can have mitigating strategies that help students before they get to the point where they feel like things are out of control. And some of that is about adapting to the conditions of uncertainty 
uncertainty and controlling the things you can control. So you heard Dean Grisafi talk about sessions with Assistant Provost Jill Stratton about building in breaks. We also know that the Center for Student Wellbeing makes appointments virtually or um, through distanced uh, opportunities to talk about time management with students. And the last thing I would say along these lines is some of the things that we're reading in the general population right now about mental health. I've been thinking a lot about how we continue to make sure that our students are aware that they have some resources available in their own planning. And I'll be very specific here. From the research that I've seen, and some of my colleagues on the call may know this better, uh, many people are saying from the mental health profession that there are three things that you can do to really you know, make sure you're checking in with yourself. One is physical movement. Right? Many of us need to take a break from being on Zoom and in chairs all day. The second is really thinking about um, your stopping, stopping the feeling of feeling like you're breathing hard and heavy all the time, mindful meditation. There's a lot of research that suggests we can have small times of the day where we take time out for breathing. And the third is social interaction. And I think one thing you've heard in many iterations today is that we have all learned how to adapt socially, whether that's a distance walk with a friend around the track, that's something I do when we're all masked up and six to 10 feet apart, or whether that's a phone call with a friend, but those three things, Things. moving, thinking about your breathing and your thoughts and getting centered, and then also making sure that you reach out to someone. We're looking at some programming, but also some ways to remind each other that those three things could be game changers each and every day. Okay, thank you, Vice Provost Beasley. So uh, we've reached the end of our time for um, continuing to field questions. My Special, special thanks to the students and the family members who joined us here today and who submitted those questions. I want you to know that we've kept a record, we're keeping a record of the questions that we did not get to today so that we can be sure that we address them on the Return to Campus website. So look there for more information in terms of the questions that you have. And now I wanna hand uh, the program back over to Chancellor Deermeyer to close this out. I'm looking forward to seeing um, so many of you in the coming months. Thank you, Provost Venti. And thank you all for this great discussions, for the great questions and um, great answers. And uh, most importantly, for your commitment uh, to Vanderbilt and for making this spring semester just as successful or even more successful than, we, than the fall semester. Um, as you can tell, this has been a Herculean effort uh, by our faculty and by our staff to get us where we are. Um, as you could see, our plan uh, is based on the best science and public health. Um, that doesn't mean that we have all the answers. I think we, we, you heard a lot of times the, 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 the answer, which was, we don't know yet. We would love to know, but the data is not yet available. doesn't mean we have all the answer, but it means that everything that we do, <clears throat> we were rigorous and based on data and evidence. And, but because the situation is changing and we're learning so much more about it almost every day, our plan has to be flexible we have to constantly learn, adapt, and improve. And that's what we have been doing. And then lastly, it's very important that we think about this from the point of view of what makes Vanderbilt special. We're a collaborative community. We're one community. We're one Vanderbilt. And we need to partner together, faculty, staff, students, parents, to take care of ourselves and of each other. The bottom line is we had a very successful fall semester. We welcomed all of our students back. And our incidence and positivity rates were much lower than what we've seen in our community. Um, ironically, you can say the safest place um, for our students to be in Nashville is to be in a Vanderbilt classroom. And that didn't just happen by accident. Um, it's a consequence of the work that, uh, that we as a community put together jointly. Um, it was based on regular asymptomatic testing, state-of-the-art contract tracing, and great medical care uh, when we needed it, and in particular the support um, of our uh, School of Medicine and a School of Nursing. Um, so when you want to think about it, is that uh, just purely from a health point of view, uh, Vanderbilt is a place you want to be right now. And with your continued dedication, uh, we can make this a reality. It's very important that the success that we had didn't just fall from the sky and wasn't preordained, but it required the constant commitment and participation of our students and the family that support them. And that's what we need to do as we move forward. I just wanna say in passing um, something that, is, uh, that, I, that, that we are very proud of, uh, which is the role uh, of our faculty uh, in advancing uh, the fight 
against COVID-19 in every aspect, whether it's uh, from treatment to vaccines, clinical trial standards of clinical care, Vanderbilt faculty have been at the absolute forefront of that, including uh, the development of, of, of path-breaking antibody therapies um, and, uh, and most recently the vaccines. So this is something we're proud of and that, that knowledge and that expertise feeds also the development and execution of our plans as we're thinking about the spring semester. So there have been great progress. There's been a tremendous amount of work, but we cannot underestimate the risks of the pandemic. Indeed, uh, arguably right now with the increased incident rates, um, we are at the most pivotal point so far. Uh, that said, we're ready. Uh, we will need everybody's participation. We will need everybody's commitment. And we will need our families to support our students and as they're taking on uh, this next challenge. So let's work together to protect our classmates and our families and do what we can to foster an empowering education. This is a historic moment, and it will be one in which we all can take pride on for decades to come. So anchor down, step up, and see you all later this month. Thank you very much.